the certain documents that are related to this device. One of the most important documents is a letter from the researcher or from the institute stating that, th that this device is going to be intended for research purposes only. It's not for, uh, uh, it's not for uh, sale and it's not for marketing purpose. Uh, we request that from the dealer who's, uh, who's uh, importing the device. Now, uh, this process could be done by a dealer or by an institute. Institutes can register themselves, you can go to the University or the research center can uh, register themselves as importers. And uh, so far, when we looked in our records, uh, we have from King Abdulaziz University, a gentleman named Jamil Ismail with this phone number. This person is authorized to go into the MDIL system to request uh, request uh, importing uh, material devices or chemical substances for research. Um, this is the current situation. This uh, hopefully will uh, try to, if you would like to become one of uh, those, uh, like King Fahad Center, we, we, we welcome that. We can go over that process. It's not that uh, hard. Genomic Center. Genomic Center. Genomic Center, yes. Genomic Center. Even King Fahad Center, Genomic Center, King Abdulaziz University. We welcome everyone. Uh, on our website, you can see the Khadamat al Electronia, and then uh, this is the MDIL module, the second one. You see it, Nidam, Eden al Istirad al Ajiz al Mustadiyat al Tabbiya. And then over here, you will have to enter your username and password. Every dealer, every company in the kingdom that imports medical devices must have a registration number with Saudi FDA. Uh, and before we give that registration number, we visit the place, we visit the site, we have some. Uh, regulations on that. So either a dealer or an institute. So uh, the genomic center may have a username and a password over here, and they could do it themselves uh, instead of uh, having the importer do it. Uh, some documents are required, uh, like the quotation, the price, the invoice. This is the current situation now. Uh, this is for medical devices. Uh, for drugs, it's a similar situation. Within Saudi FDA, we have the drug sector, sector and the medical devices sector. So if the application was for drugs, chemicals uh, used for uh, uh, drugs-related issues, it will go to the drugs uh, sector. If it's a medical device or a reagent, it will come to the uh, medical device sector. I will uh, try to expedite just because of the time. Now, this process takes only one day within Saudi FDA. It takes only one day within Saudi FDA. However, I know that many of uh, the researchers may take about one month to more to clear some of the items. So what's happening? Uh, what happened, let me first, so now we go to the proposed system. In the current system, an importer or an institute needs to upload some material and some items and it's under the MDIL, and it's kind of not user-friendly, in my opinion. Now we'll put a link for in the main page that says Research Institutes. And this is uh, a beta version, and I would request uh, your help in evaluating this beta version. So at the end, inshallah, please, I need 20 people from Dr. Muhammad. If you give me their emails, I'll send you the, uh, the website link, and I will send you the documents that we have developed for uh, the guidelines uh, for uh, uploading your material. And please let us know what you think. If you think we need to modify, let us know. Once we get your feedback, this should be launched within, um, it, it shouldn't take more than a week for us to do the modifications required. So please register as Dr. Uh, Muhammad, and inshallah we can uh, proceed with this. In the new system, you will have a, a link in the main page that says researchers. And now a researcher, him or herself, or an institute, or a company, can apply. It's not only, and you don't need to be registered within, uh, as a researcher with us to uh, apply for a, 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 a clearance. Uh, a researcher page will have certain requirements. Just upload them, put the information, and within, within six hours, we claim, inshallah, we are hoping and aiming that within six hours, the uh, application will be cleared from our side, provided that, I mean, all, all documents are submitted. 
uh, in time. So there will be a link for researchers, a link for institutes, a link for uh, establishments or dealers do, uh, companies to uh, request this clearance material. Now, what, the most important document is that a researcher or an institute is saying this material, this subject, this matter, this device is for research purposes only. And of course, the quantity needs to be a bit, I mean, limited. You don't like uh, ask uh, for a lot of, uh, like 10, 15 devices uh, for research purposes. It, it, this is how it goes. So what happens when the shipment arrives? When a shipment arrives, the first entity that receives the, the shipment is the Saudi Air Cargo. Saudi Air Cargo or the Sikkal Hadidiya or the Port Authority. This is the first port, this is the first agency that receives the shipment. This shipment, this agency looks at the papers and decides whether this should go to the customs or goes elsewhere. Usually, if there is anything strange, they will shift it to the customs. This takes some time. Now the Saudi customs classifies everything that comes in and decides whether this thing can be cleared directly or it has to go through a specialized agency. There are 14 different government institutes and agencies that the customs may transfer the shipment to for clearance. This is, we didn't come in the picture yet. So the customs decide whether this should go to the Saudi FDA or should go to the, to the uh, Ministry of Commerce or should go to the Ministry of Media or should go elsewhere. Once it arrives to us, to the Saudi FDA, we decide whether it's a medicine or a, or, or a medical device and we go into our process. For us, currently, currently, our KPI is one day. It doesn't take more than one day for us to clear any shipment for research, even if it takes you one month to receive it, it will not take us more than one day to clear it from Saudi FDA. Where is the delay happening? It's happening here and there. Some of it is happening within us because uh, the uh, documents we receive are incomplete or the phone numbers of the people are not incomplete or there is something that we are requiring. But currently the average time for us to clear any research shipment is one day. Uh, some of the material we receive, if it's chemicals that are explosives or flammables or dangerous, there is a list of chemicals given to us by Al Amn Al Am, National Public Security. The public security requires us to uh, inform them about this material. So after we approve it, we send it to the public security office, Al Amn Al Am, and we do it internally. And uh, once that is done, the researcher or whoever is important receives an email stating that your shipment contains some explosive materials that requires the national security, the public security sector to approve it. Uh, so the document will go over there. If, if uh, the permit is granted from us, this is just a sample. Uh, however, if you see this red, uh, red circle, it says some of the items require the public security approval. Uh, so internally, we will send a letter to the public uh, security. We will send the documents to the public security department. And an email will be sent to the owner of the shipment, uh, stating that a letter was sent to the public security office with the following number and the following date. And the person needs to follow it up with them. Uh, once uh, they issue the letter, they will give you another clearance uh, form that you can take and uh, clear your uh, shipment. Uh, I think time is uh, passing, so I'll just, this is, this is the list of items that must go to the public uh, security uh, office. I can give that to Dr. Muhammad and share it with anyone if you want to send me your email. Uh, it's a big list, by the way. Uh, all these chemicals, uh, if we receive any of this uh, material, we have to go to the public security office. So once that is done, we issue the clearance. We hope that the new system will be uh, user friendly and will uh, make things and life easy for researchers. Uh, we're trying to improve it. That's why uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Adil and all the organizers to allowing me to come and uh, present this because we need your feedback to ensure that uh, 
the new initiative will actually serve the purpose and will uh, help uh, all of us uh, in our goals. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazik. Uh, I think this is I think this is history making because we have got like uh, very very important people over here, and for the first time, SFDA is also having high caliber, credible doctors from the university moving on to such high positions who understand reality on the ground and they are trying to expedite uh, things you know, in the organization to make life easier for the researchers. However, the last uh, uh, slide that was displayed with the chemicals, it was quite evident that most of them are used in our genetic experiments anyway. <laughs> so they will require some scrutiny. Uh, right, we will uh, have just since we are 25 minutes overboard, we'll have five minutes uh, for any questions for Dr. Nazif or Dr. Omar, uh, for Professor Magdalena. Unfortunately, Dr. Uh, Professor Suelem has uh, had to leave. So if anybody has some general remark, comment, or question, please feel free. We have Dr. Faisal Abu Dhuber. Uh, he has come all the, he's the dean of Faculty of Applied Medical Sciences, all the way from Tabuk. Please. Uh, we have a tracking system within the Saudi FDA. Unfortunately, when the documents come from us, from the customs, they are coming paper, with paper. So it comes to us, we can track it once in, inside the Saudi FDA. There is an initiative now to link the Saudi customs with the Saudi FDA, and it's in the final stages. Once that takes place, it will really be very helpful because then you will know exactly where the shipment is and what's going on with it and what's happening. Uh, uh, so in the new system, the researcher, him or herself, can apply, or the institute, or the company. Currently, it's only the company. In the new system, we'll have the researcher, and the company, and then the institute. Whoever is, uh, so if the genomic center decides that they want to centralize, they can do it. If they want to allow every researcher to buy it for themselves, they can do it. If they want to give it to the company, they can do it. It's, it's your choice. Right. Thank you very much, the audience, for we'll close the first session now. And uh, we can all proceed for the first break, which will be 15 minutes. So hopefully at 11.05, we'll be back for the second session. So we are happy to introduce the keynote speaker, Prof. Jerishé. Uh, if I will introduce him, I may spend half a day, if not the full day. So I would like to make a shortcut. Please, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Prof. Jerry, welcome. The stage is yours. Since we're running behind, I encouraged him to uh, make the introduction as short as possible so that we could try to get back on schedule. Well, first of all, I want to thank all the organizers for, uh, for hosting us and uh, for inviting us back. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see, uh, see friends. Uh, what I'd like to do today is we've heard a little bit about personalized medicine, precision medicine. I'm going to go from a very general uh, sort of uh, talk to a very specific topic. Many of you know that I have some other interests and uh, have been interacting with many of you here at the uh, at the uh, Center for Genomics uh, Medical Research. Uh, but with today I'm going to talk about uh, a project that I've been working on for a long time, which is connecting aging and cancer. Uh, and, and the question is, are the ends of our chromosomes called telomeres, and the enzyme that maintains the ends of our chromosomes, telomerase, the connection? So I'm going to have a, a, a second a little uh, subpart, which is uh, a new concept, which is how uh, you can regulate genes by the length of telomeres. And so for you to appreciate why that's uh, an important question, I first have to give you some introductory information. So by way of introduction, I think most people probably know that human cells have 46 chromosomes, 92 ends, and the ends of all of our chromosomes are capped with these elements called telomeres. Telomeres are these T2AG3 repeats at the ends, and they're there to sort of cap the ends of each of our chromosomes. Uh, it's actually been known for now over 30 years that, in fact, telomeres progressively shorten every time a cell divides. 
and it's been believed and has been discussed uh, many, many decades almost now, over 20 years, that uh, when telomeres get short, that induces some sort of DNA damage signal that causes the cells to undergo a growth arrest or what they call replicative senescence. This doesn't just happen in cells and culture, it happens in real human beings. So if you look at tissues, reproductive tissues, uh, et cetera, uh, you can see when we're born or we're young, we have very long telomeres, somewhere on the order of 15 kilobase pairs of telomeres. But as we age, all our telomeres and all of our cells that divide, like the colonic mucosa, blood cells, et cetera, all get progressively shortened. This is a correlation. It certainly doesn't prove telomeres cause aging, but it's actually a very good biomarker of, uh, of your, what we would call, instead of your chronological age, your biological age. So what's the problem with having short telomeres? The problem with having short telomeres is that if they get too short, you lose tissue renewal capacity. This is a failure of stem cells to divide in sufficient numbers. You don't run out of stem cells. There are humans that have lived well over 110 years of age. And so we know that those people may be frail, but they still have stem cells. They can still uh, heal a wound on their skin. They can still make uh, 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 mononuclear cells in their blood, et cetera. There's a more recent uh, consequence of short telomeres, which has been called SASP, SASP, or Senescence Associated Secretory Phenotype. And that concept is really very simple. It says that when cells get short, uh, that these senescent-like cells can actually secrete a series of chemokines, cytokines, that can lead to increased inflammation and decreased immune responses. And there's been many correlations. Over the last decade, there's been literally thousands of papers showing that if you can measure your telomeres in your peripheral blood leukocytes, that short lymphocyte or leukocyte telomeres strongly correlate with the onset of a variety of diseases such as cardiovascular disease, increased risk for liver disease, uh, and including a plastic anemia, and of course, cancer. So this has sort of led to the idea that the, what we call the telomere hypothesis of aging and cancer. We now know from, again, from literally hundreds if not thousands of publications that most precancerous lesions or premalignant lesions have very short telomeres. And so we think that in fact short telomeres in fact may be in fact at least initially a cancer preventive mechanism for organisms that are large, like we are, and that live a long time, and that this may be a sort of a blockade against uh, the initial development of cancer. But obviously, in combination with other genetic alterations, this can drive uh, genomic instability and leading to uh, an increased risk of developing cancer. Now, one of the hallmarks of cancer, most of you have seen and heard about the various hallmarks of cancer is that cells can divide unlimitless. Uh, they can divide forever, basically, or they're immortal. Uh, so how do cells, if they have short telomeres, uh, stabilize their telomeres for the long-term growth of the advanced cancer? And the way they do that is by activating this enzyme called telomerase. Now, telomerase is the only cellular reverse transcriptase in our body. Uh, it is one of the key hallmarks of cancer, as I've already mentioned. It is actually present in over 90% of all cancers. And in fact, today, there are mutations in the telomerase, the TERT promoter, the telomerase reverse transcriptase. Uh, mutations are the most frequent non-coding mutation in cancer. So we now know that in malignant melanoma, 70% of patients with skin cancer, especially melanomas, have mutations in the promoter of the telomerase gene that leads to a new transcription factor being able to activate this, uh, this important uh, enzyme. Uh, the important thing is that telomerase is actually not present in the vast majority of normal tissues and that almost all cancer cells do in fact have very short telomeres. So when you put all this together, you're sort of asking your question, so, uh, you know, would telomerase actually be a, a, a good target for cancer therapy? 
So the first thing that I ask myself is why is it only in 90%? Why is it in 100%? 90% is pretty good. Well, it turns out there are certain cancers, in fact, that don't have telomeres. And the example here is one from a pediatric cancer. This is called neuroblastoma. It's an adrenal tumor, medullary region of the adrenal gland that occurs in small children. And like all cancers, they grade them by stage one, two, three, four. And what you're seeing on the left side here is what we call the TRAP assay, this, this, the telomerase or the telomeric repeat amplification protocol. And as you can see, with increasing stage, you get more of this uh, sort of banding pattern that you see, which is actually just has how the assay works, showing that at higher stages, you wind up with more and more of these, of these uh, hexameric repeats that you see as a ladder. Uh, you don't see any of this enzyme activity in normal tissue. And of course, if you inhibit the enzyme by treating with RNases, it goes away. The thing that was surprising in this study of ours was uh, a, a category of this pediatric cancer called 4S neuroblastoma. And when you look at that particular cancer, these children are born without any telomerase activation, yet they have metastatic disease. And when you look at their telomeres on the right side of the, of the slide, what you can see here is like what we call a TRF uh, gel. This is a terminal restriction fragment. This is a way to, one of many ways to measure telomere length. And what you see is that the children with 4S neuroblastoma have very short telomeres. The N stands for normal, T stands for the tumor. So their normal tissues are up there above 10 kilobase pairs, whereas their tumors are very short. So we asked a simple question. What is the prognosis of patients with telomerase negative tumors? And in fact, this is one of the more interesting results, and that is these children that don't have telomerase activity, this is a kaplan meier survival curve, actually have outstanding uh, outcomes that in fact, if you don't have telomerase, that almost always correlates with uh, long-term survival, whereas those small percent of children that do have telomerase activity, this is a very bad outcome. So again, what this particular example showed is two things. One is you don't need to have telomerase to have an advanced cancer. Clearly, these children uh, without telomerase didn't have cancer, but it's what's perhaps more important. It said without a mechanism to maintain the telomeres, your cells, in fact, cannot continue to grow. Or what we believe happens in this particular type of cancer is eventually those metastatic cancer cells can't continue to divide. They stop dividing. They're then recognized by macrophages and phagocytic cells in the body, and they're cleared. So we think that this really is a proof of concept that telomerase inhibitors may be a really potent anti-cancer protection mechanism. So what I'd like to do now is to tell you about a clinical trial we've just completed, and then I'm going to tell you about a new approach for targeting this enzyme, telomerase. So the first direct telomerase enzyme inhibitor that went through clinical trials was called imatelstat or GRN163L. It's really not a small molecule. It's actually an oligonucleotide, and what it does is it recognizes and binds to the telomerase RNA. So to make the enzyme telomerase, you need a functional RNA and you need the reverse transcriptase. And those two have to come together. They have to go to the telomere. So every time the telomere shortens a little bit in cancer cells, this enzyme complex re-elongates the telomeres just a little bit. And so what you wind up seeing in cancer cells is that the telomeres stay short, but they never get shorter. They just stable. So this particular imatelstat is a competitive telomerase template antagonist, so it's not antisense. It doesn't target messenger RNA, but the functional RNA that is required for recognizing the telomeric repeats. It inhibits telomerase and telomere shorten in vitro and in xenograft models. Lots of publications were, were, were presented on this work and therefore it moved forward to a phase one clinical trial. It was reasonably well tolerated in patients, and they finally, uh, just this last year, completed a phase two trial for stage four non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which is now published. Uh, this is the concept. The concept on the left is standard of care chemotherapy or radiation therapy. 
What you see on the left side of the slide is that one is presented with a patient with a reasonably large tumor mass. One then treats that patient with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. You get a partial response, especially with solid tumors. And uh, almost universally, you get a recurrence of disease. And this is our number one problem today. That's due to drug resistance, drugs not being effective enough. Uh, we could talk about that for the rest of this conference and not come to a satisfactory conclusion. But I think most people agree we need more targeted therapies, more precision therapies, better enrollment uh, biomarkers for patients that are being treated with cancer. The important thing about our slide on the left is we're not doing anything to the telomeres. So we reasoned that if we were to combine chemotherapy with a potent telomerase inhibitor like imatelstat, that not only would we get these partial responses, but during this treatment period, we would get shorter and shorter telomeres, and maybe we would have long-term durable responses instead of uh, only a partial response. Well, it turns out in the initial trials, there was increased toxicities in a breast cancer trial when you combine standard of care chemotherapy with a telomerase inhibitor. Uh, we could discuss why that is. It turned out that patients were getting uh, uh, low platelet counts, thrombocytopenia. And when that happens, you have to go off of drug therapy. And for a thing that is trying to drive the telomere shorter, that was a real problem. So instead, we decided on a different approach. We said, for patients with non-small cell lung cancer, what we usually do in almost all cancers today, we have what we call first-line therapies. These are therapies that have been worked out over the last few decades. And for most patients with non-small cell lung cancer that are not resectable, this is usually stage 3B or 4, that they go through a round of, uh, of, a, of a microtubule inhibitor, paclitaxel, plus cisplatinum. This is called doublet chemotherapy. And again, in advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients, two out of three patients actually do pretty well. Again, this is late stage metastatic disease. And so what we found was that maybe what we should do is try this imatelstat in the maintenance setting because all these patients are going to relapse. And so we then designed a phase two trial to add imatelstat in a maintenance setting. In, that, in other words, in those two out of three patients that managed to live long enough and have partial responses, they had to be given an additional treatment. And that was the name of the trial, which is listed on here. I won't go through the whole uh, details of this, but in fact, this was uh, basically giving patients frontline or first line therapy, and sometimes they were on an angiogenesis inhibitor, bevacizumab, and then those patients that did well from their first uh, front uh, first line therapy were randomized either to imatelstat alone, imatelstat plus bevacizumab, bevacizumab alone, or just observation. Some patients, after going through a first round of therapy decide that's enough. So that was the trial. There was 114 patients in this trial, and the results are shown on the next slide. So if you just look at the initial results, it, it looked like at the median survival, there was about a three-month overall median survival. Now, I'm not an oncologist. You know, I'm a basic scientist, and to me, uh, there are pharmaceutical companies that will go to the bank with a result like that. They say a three-month medium survival, even a slight increase in overall survival is worth trying to go and to do a phase three trial and get FDA approval. The company that was helping to sponsor this trial decided not to pursue this, and I think they made a smart decision for the following reason. If you look at how this drug works, uh, a major problem with direct telomerase inhibitors is really the long lag period. When you add this telomerase inhibitor into a patient, it is starting to shorten those already short telomeres, but the cells don't immediately die. In fact, those cells have to grow for a while, as you see in the blue and the pink on this slide. If you have short telomeres, the tumor is actually going to grow for a while, and eventually a subset of your cells in that heterogeneous tumor are going to get shorter and shorter, and eventually, you will have the cells to undergo apoptosis. And so that lag period was a real problem. So we sat down and scratched our heads and said, what we really want is a telomerase type of inhibitor 
that would work just like chemotherapy, where you'd have a very rapid response. And that's what I want to tell you about. This is all new work. Uh, part of it is published. It was just published in Cancer Discovery earlier this year. Uh, what we were looking for, as you see on the right side, is a way of causing uh, cells with telomerase to basically uncap their telomeres so they would be recognized as DNA damage so the cells would immediately undergo apoptosis. So we sat down and said, what would be the best way to approach that? And the way we approached that was to say, let's see what other drugs are out there and could we design a drug that might be more preferentially recognized by telomerase and incorporated into the telomeres. And so we looked at one of the original drugs that's ever been used as a chemotherapeutic drug, not the first, but one of the early ones, called 6-thioguanine. And what we did is we said, you know, the telomeres are full of these tracks of G, so it's T2A, G, 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 and you have thousands of these repeats. And I said, what if we put into a telomere a, mis a, a, a nucleoside that would now not let the telomeres be capped properly and they'd be recognized as damaged. So we modified 6 thioguanine into the compound you see at the bottom right there, 6 thio 2 prime deoxyguanosine or 6 thio dg And we predicted that when this was given to cells, it would be immediately, it'd be preferentially recognized by telomerase. This altered nucleoside would be incorporated in the telomeres and it would be almost immediately recognized as having DNA damage. And so we tested that on a panel of cell lines. So this is a, uh, a typical experiment. If you look at the top where the control, this is just a panel of three non-small cell lung cancer lines. And if you look at 6 thiodeoxyguanosine treated with low micromolar for one week, literally 99% of all cells were killed. We had a panel of over 100 cancer cell lines. And as you can see, out of all the cancer cell lines that are in green that are reasonably sensitive to this drug, only four of these cell lines were, in fact, resistant. That's actually a pretty good track record when you think about that all these non-small cell lung cancer lines were mostly obtained from patients with metastatic disease, probably after going through a few rounds of chemotherapy, and I'll come back to that. So what we, the reason why we use this panel of cell lines is because we have complete genomic state on this. We have DNA methylation, we've got exome sequencing, we've got DNA microarrays, et cetera. So if you just look at the microarrays of this, this is a panel of 71 cell lines, what you can see is these four on the left, where you see the red and the green, completely separate on cluster analysis as a heat map. Red means there's these four lines that you see on the left completely separate from all the cell, the other 67 cell lines on this particular uh, analysis. That suggests that we actually have a biomarker enrollment criteria. We can say if your tumor looks like that on the left, you would be a bad candidate for 6 thiodeoxyguanosine. And I think that's what's really becoming important today in this era of precision or more personalized medicine is to make sure the drug you give a person has a higher probability of working and we don't give drugs to people that we don't think will receive benefit from it. So the second question that you would ask, or I asked, was what effect does this have on normal cells? And without going through all the details, these are normal cells, they still look normal after treatment, and you can look at the IC50 charts. On the top is a, uh, is a, a colon cancer cell line with an IC50 of about one micromolar. To the right is a, a lung cancer cell line, A549, with an IC50 of 2.4. And on the bottom left is just normal diploid uh, primary cultures of human colonic epithelial cells. And on the right, some normal human fibroblasts with IC50s of over 100 micromolar. So this suggests that this drug is not affecting normal cells, but it is very potently killing cells that have telomerase activity. Normal cells don't have telomerase, as you might recall. And then the other important thing, the criteria was that we suggested that this drug would cause DNA damage specifically at the telomeres. And so if you see this little image on the left versus the one on the right, on the left is a, is a cell that was treated with 6 thiodeoxyguanosine, uh, without, with, wasn't treated with 6 thioguanine and what you're seeing in green is one of the, what you call the shelter in proteins. This is one of the telomere binding proteins 
and the green dots reflect the little telomeres on all of our chromosomes. If you look on the right, this was treated with 6-thiodeoxyguanosine. This is our new telomerase-mediated uh, uncapping compound. What you see is uh, when we co-stain with TRF2, which is the Sheltrin protein, gamma H2AX, which is a DNA double-stranded uh, 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 recognition, and, and, and what you see in yellow is, in fact, co-localization. So what you see on the right is that a number of the telomeres are actually co-localizing with DNA damage. So what does that really mean? Well, the first thing you've got to understand, and let me just show it to you in real data, this is a similar thing, but with the data at the bottom. The important issue is that the telomeres only represent one six thousandth of the total human genome. So to see a TIF, as we call it, a telomere-induced foci or dysfunctional foci, that that would be very unusual by chance alone. And to see that, in fact, on the bottom right, that after 72 hours of treatment, you know, 35% uh, of all cells in a population have, uh, have four or more of these TIFs suggest that this is working by the mechanism which we thought. A another important proof of concept is shown here. 6 thiaguanine remember, was the parental compound from which we derived this nucleoside. And so if you look at the top, we were looking at a normal diploid fibroblast, and on the bottom two panels, we're looking at the same fibroblast that we put telomerase in ectopically, so we immortalize cells with telomerase. And then we treated these either with 6 thiaguanine or 6 thiodeoxyguanosine. So in the top you see, again, it's the same thing, TRF2, the Sheltrin protein, the telomere protein, the, the gamma H2X, which is a DNA damage foci. You could see in normal BJs without telomerase, it doesn't matter what you treat them with, you don't see any TIFs. But in BJ cells that have been immortalized with telomerase, you only see TIFs in those cells that were treated with 6-thiodeoxyguanosine, not 6-thioguanine. So that was another important proof to us that this drug was working by the mechanism that we thought it was working. And finally, we wanted to know how did this compare against 6 thioguanine because it's still used for arthritis, it's used for inflammatory bowel disease, it's used in some certain uh, pediatric leukemias. So we just took wild-type mice and asked, do in fact the mice lose weight, you know, their toxicities and things like that? And as you can see, while well, 6 thioguanine is well recognized to have certain cytotoxic effects, the animals on the top did lose weight at what we would consider therapeutic doses, somewhere between 1.6 and maybe 2.5 um, uh, uh, microgram, um, uh, milligrams per kg in a mouse is an effective dose for, for therapeutic indicus. And as you can see on the bottom, when we went up to 5 mg per kg, the, all the mice actually died that were on 6 thioguanine, but it, only the animals just didn't gain weight with the 6 thiodeoxyguanosine. So there's likely to be some side effects of this drug, but it's going to be much milder than what we expect to see with 6 thioguanine. Uh, and finally, we did xenograph experiments, and it also beat 6 thioguanine. And xenograph experiments, as seen here on the bottom, is the 6 thiodeoxyguanosine. The tumors basically uh, did not progress during the, uh, the two-and-a-half-week uh, treatment period. We did, uh, obviously, uh, toxicity testing, and I'm not going to waste time going through this, but basically there was less toxicity than what we saw with 6 thioguanine, and we didn't see any obvious histopathology from, uh, from 30 days of treatment. Uh, again, this is using 2 mix per kg. And finally, I want to just say one important thing, and the important thing we heard about earlier had to do with overcoming drug resistance. Uh, without going through the information on the left, a student uh, in John Minna's lab took a lung cancer cell line and subjected it over 18 cycles to exactly the kinds of treatment that you would do for a patient, giving them cycles of paclitaxel and, and, and cisplatinum. And what, they, what she derived, as you see the red lines over there, she could make these cells much, much more resistant to paclitaxel carboplatinum. And that's classically what happens. And what we did is say, are those drug-resistant cells sensitive or resistant to 6-thiodeoxyguanosine? And as you can see on the bottom right, they're still sensitive to the drug. 
So it looks like this could be a really good drug going forward to overcome multi-drug resistance. And so to summarize this part, uh, basically what we've shown is that, in fact, telomerase still remains a highly attractive target for cancer therapy. Uh, for every other uh, targeted therapy, let's just go back to angiogenesis, there may be 20 or 30 different drugs that have been either approved or that are in clinical development. And in telomerase, there's imitalstat and this new drug that we're working on. So this is an under-researched area, and we need to have more scientists working on telomerase as an attractive target for cancer therapy. And we showed that this new nucleoside analog of 6-thioguanine, 6-thiodeoxyguanosine, shows both general DNA damage and telomere-specific damage, but only in cells that express telomerase, which is important. It's a low molecular weight, oral available drug. It's less toxic in vitro compared to 6-thioguanine, and it's o it overcomes multi-drug resistance, and it's inexpensive to make, and it should be easy moving forward into clinical trials uh, in the future. So that brings me to the last shorter part of my, of my presentation, and that is what really is the mechanisms that are causing these short telomeres to induce uh, damage or to make cells stop dividing? And the classical idea is shown on the left, which is that telomeres form these special looping structures, they call it a T-loop, and they think when cells get short enough, the telomeres get short enough, that loop gets unwound, basically, and it now looks like a DNA double-strand break. And, and you can't cap the telomeres with your shelterin proteins. This is what everybody in the field believes, and I believe it too. But I think there's a second possibility that people haven't been thinking about very much, which we call, on the right, telomere position effects. This concept has been around in yeast biology for almost two decades, but hasn't really been pursued very much in mammalian cell biology. The idea is that when you have long telomeres when you're young, there could be genes next to a telomere that are silenced, and as telomeres gradually shorten with increased age, that you could actually be turning on genes uh, that are close to a telomere. And I will come back to that in a minute. First of all, I just want to show you quickly, DNA damage does occur at telomeres. So if you look at this, this is fibroblast when they're senescent, and you look at all these recruitment factors, these DNA repair uh, factors, MBS1, MDC1, et cetera, 53BP1, they co-localize with gamma H2X. So we know that a lot of the factors that are recognizing DNA damage uh, are there. We don't know that those are necessarily always at telomeres. So let's go to the TPE. So we know there's DNA damage, but what is the evidence for telomere position effects uh, regulating some aspect of senescence or aging? So in the yeast field, it's been shown uh, that, in fact, if you take a gene from an area of the genome that's where it's actively transcribed and move it near a telomere, it becomes positionally silenced. So we know there's something special about the chromatin that are near telomeres. And in yeast, it's been shown the strength of TPE is proportional to the telomere length. So if telomeres are shorter, you can get more genes close to a telomere being turned on. And when we got into this field, we asked a simple question. Does TPE exist in mammalian cells? And if so, this would be a really elegant mechanism, if you think about it, to actually turn on a gene before you have a DNA damage signal. Because if you could do that, you could start thinking about things that affect people over decades. You know, what turns on uh, the signal to go through puberty in a young child, you know, in a teenager? Uh, you say, well, it's hormones. What turns on the hormones? What's the signal, okay? Is it just growth? Or could it be that as your telomeres shorten as a teenager a little bit, some gene gets turned on somewhere else that was silenced prior to that. So we liked that idea, and we decided to spend a little bit of energy to study that. And we did this first with a graduate student in the lab, uh, and we, without going through the details, we wanted to first of all prove that TPE actually existed in mammalian cells, so we made a luciferase reporter. We either put it internally, as you see the red dots on the left, or we inserted it near a telomere, and we could show by looking at the luciferase expression 
that the internal uh, uh, luciferase reporter was tenfold higher expression than the one that was by telomer. So it looks like the same phenomena that was happening in yeast was happening in mammalian cells. But nobody had ever shown an endogenous gene in humans was, uh, was regulated by TPE. The idea, again, in cartoon form, just so you can appreciate it, is that when telomeres are long, you would have some sort of silencing of genes next to the telomere. As telomeres shorten, gene one would turn on, then possibly gene two. So the way we went after this originally was sort of old-fashioned today, is we actually made a, what we call the telomere microarray chip. So we made a, 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 a spotted array containing over 1,300 genes from sing, single copy uh, genes that were sub-telomeric within about a megabase or a little bit further. As that turned out to be in, uh, quite a few genes on the spotted array, we did it in triplicate. And then what we did is we added some other control genes and all that to, to this array. And then we asked, was there any differential expression if you looked at RNA or DNA from, or RNA from a young cell versus an old cell, okay? An old cell would have short telomeres. Did we see any genes going up in the old cells that was silenced in young cells? And it turns out this is what you would expect, okay? And we had good controls for these experiments. You would expect in a young cell with long telomeres for this gene to be low expressed. As the telomeres got shorter and shorter and you're turning on a gene next to a telomere, it would be highly expressed. And if you re-elongated those telomeres by putting telomerase in a cell, you should get it silenced again. We weren't interested in DNA damaging genes, so the way you avoided that was by having re taking old cells and re-elongating the telomeres. To make a long story short, we found a gene called interferon stimulating gene 15 that met this criteria. We found others, but this is the one I'll just show you today. It's published. Basically, if you look at it uh, in the top right, which are Western blot in young BJ cells, there's very, very low expression of ISG15. And in BJ cells, it says 83 population doublings, you can see that the protein levels go way up. And if you look on the far right of that western blot, you can see when we immortalize cells with telomerase, it goes back down. And this doesn't just happen in cells in culture, it also happens in real people. This is actually skin biopsies from humans, and you can see as you become older and older, more and more of your cells in your skin express more and more of ISG-15. So what is ISG-15? It's right by a telomere, it's within one megabase of the telomere. It's believed to be an innate immunity gene. It can be induced by interferon, especially type 1 interferon. Uh, there's a lot of functions about it that we don't know. So we don't know uh, if it's involved in splicing, chromatin remodeling, stress responses. So it's a big unknown, and we're continuing to study interferon-stimulated gene 15 going forward. But we ran into a problem. The trouble is we, we did this whole experiment, and now we turned around and we asked a question. What about the genes that were between ISG15 and the telomere? Were they also being turned on with shortening of telomeres? And it turned out that wasn't the case. So all of a sudden, classic telomere position effects wasn't holding up. That there were genes, we just call them X and Y here, that were not being turned on with short telomeres, but ISG15 was. So we had to put on our thinking caps, we had to go back and figure out well, how could telomere length changes be regulating genes over long distances? And that's what we called it. And basically, we started looking at all the really exciting work that people are doing now, looking at chromosome, what they call chromosome looping, which is that things such as how the DNA is folded up, there are enhancers, insulators, various heterochromatin marks that can change how genes are actually expressed in three-dimensional space. So we went through and we published a few papers on this already using a modified circularized chromosome confirmation capture method and 3D cofish to determine if genes near telomeres are really being regulated by, telom by chromosome looping. So this was the proof of principle. Using a completely different cell type, this time we used human muscle cell types, we, we continued to study ISG15 and as you see in the top, the, with long telomeres, there's no ISG15 expressed in muscle cells, but in, with short telomeres, just like in fibroblasts, 
uh, ISG thing comes up. So we decided we needed a second mechanism to really prove that there was some sort of chromosome telomere interaction. So we actually developed a subtelomeric probe, which you can see here in red, and the ISG15 probe, which is in green, and did 3D fish right on the cells. And as you can see on the left side, in these cells with long telomeres, you could see the green and the red probes were basically adjacent to each other. 92% of the time, they were either touching or there was no space between them. Whereas when you looked at cells with short telomeres, you saw just the opposite. It was as if, as the telomere became unlooped, it was actually moving back into its original position and pot potentially affecting how that gene was regulated. So in a nutshell, what we found is that classic TPE, while it certainly exists, there is a new modified form, which we call telomere looping over long distances, or TPE old. And as you can see, that would have a lot of explanatory value going forward. So I'm going to end on one last new story, which involves the telomerase gene itself, coming back full circle from the telomerase, the TERT gene, as I was talking to you about. A very interesting thing occurred to us as we were starting these experiments, and that was the TERT gene itself, the telomerase gene, is right by a telomere. And that was really surprising to us. Why would you put such an important gene next to a telomere? And, you know, people have actually known about this gene for 15 years, and we're still not 100% sure how it's regulated. It can be regulated by transcription, as already said, and promoter mutations are very common. There's good evidence it's regulated by splicing, alternative splicing choices, and there's also evidence that maybe there's epigenetic regulation of it. And so we asked a simple question again, does telomere looping of TERT limit the maximum size or length of human telomeres? Nobody's ever really addressed that question. It's more of an evolutionary biology question. And so the first thing you do today, you go out and look at the databases. Everything's been sequenced, so it's easy to go out there and do that. And when you look at all the higher primates and you look in the green there, that's where the TERT gene is localized. In humans, chimps, gorillas, orangutans, baboons, rhesus monkey, the TERT gene is right by a telomere, whereas in mice and rats, it's really more centromerically located. So this suggested to us perhaps one mechanism that large, long-lived organisms uh, used to regulate how long their telomeres were was to, once they reached a certain length during embryonic development, because telomerase is on during human development, and in a tissue-by-tissue -tissue specific manner to get silence, what silences telomerase during development? And it could be when telomeres got to a certain length, the telomere looping could come over and silence its own gene. Was there any evidence for that? And it turns out it wasn't as dramatic as ISG-15, but still very dramatic. That is to say in young cells that uh, only 22% of the probes were separated. So again, we made a probe to the TERT gene and a probe that was right below the telomere and the TERT gene's about 1.2 megabases from the telomere. And what we could see is when the cells got old, more and more of these separated. So that was interesting. It was consistent with the idea. And nobody says you have to have both alleles moving apart. It could just be one. If you have to turn on telomerase as part of cancer, you don't have to necessarily turn on both alleles. So that could be part of the reason why a lot of them are still adjacent in this, in this study. And so we looked further. What else changes with increased uh, telomere shortening in normal cells? And it turns out we looked very carefully at promoter, uh, promoter region uh, for DNA methylation changes. And while this is sort of tricky to, uh, to read, I think you can see that the bars, the higher the bars go, the more methylation there is. And if you look at the top graph, that's really a cell with short telomeres, and you can see the entire telomerase promoter is under-methylated with increased shortening of telomeres. We also did one additional experiment. We wanted to bypass senescence, so we knocked down an important tumor suppressor gene. In this case, we knocked down P21. And now we are going to be looking at telomerase transcription. And what we observed is in young cells, if we knock down P21, we do not actually see any 
increase in transcription. We had very good knockdowns. The first lane is a control. Then we had two different SHRNAs against P21. But you could see in older BJ cells, when you knock down P21, TERT transcription went up. So what I've told you so far is illustrated on this slide. When cells are young and telomeres are long, the telomere folds over and silences the H-TERT gene. And it turns out that as you get older and your telomeres get shorter, you now enter what we have called replicative senescence or the M1 stage. And under those cases, the telomere is short and now TERT is becoming permissive uh, by changing its methylation pattern. And then if you bypass that first stage of senescence, which would be the equivalent of a pre-malignant or a benign tumor, then you start getting increased TERT transcription. So this gene is being so carefully regulated because it's an important, at least initially, tumor suppressor mechanism. And uh, you know we have to really think about uh, how this is actually happening. And I just want to end by telling you a little bit about what the mechanism for telomere looping is, okay? We don't know this at all, but an interesting, again, genomics approach has just taught, taught us that if you sequence the entire human genome, what one sees is, in fact, that there are interstitial telomeric repeats throughout our whole genome. So this is a paper that just came out last year by Steve Kozak's group, and he showed there's almost 3,000 TTAGG repeats, large repeats, short repeats throughout the human genome. Every chromosome has these interstitial repeats. And we asked the question, is it possible that the way that telomere looping is working on the tert locus, at least, is by the telomeres bending over, finding another track of telomeric repeats, and through some of these shelterin proteins, like TRF2, that's making the initial bridge to silence these. And just to, again, a bioinformatics approach is right close to the tert gene, within 100 kb, one actually does see uh, large tracts of telomeric repeats. To add value to this, we knock down TRF2, which is one of the sheltering proteins, and you immediately lose the entire capping process. Don't have time to talk about our, our 3C uh, uh, concept, but again, when you knock down TRF2 on the far right, you see the number of contacts that you have between the telomere and the tert locus goes down dramatically. Uh, also, as part of our, our chromosome confirmation capture, we showed that there were specific interactions, mostly between the TERT gene and another gene right next to it called the CLPM1L uh, gene. And that's actually quite interesting because when you look at this, you see much more interactions with young cells, the blue on the right, versus the PD70 on the, on the right as well suggesting that, again, there is a change in the number of contacts. This is a, uh, a cross-linking, a UV cross-linking approach where you can actually see if there's really interactions between the telomeric region and, uh, and the tert locus. And all the other genes that are closer to the telomere, as you can see, are not being affected. And what's interesting is this locus where these telomeric repeats are, this other gene is right there next to it. And we've just discovered that this gene, this cleft lip and palate transmembrane-like protein, is another TPE old regulated gene. And again, we know almost nothing about it, but it meets all the criteria of that. So I just want to end here by saying that telomere looping uh, occurs in a number of human genes and provides a mechanism to regulate aging by progressive telomere shortening without the induction of a DNA damage signal. Uh, telomere looping occurs between the human tert locus and the chromosome 5P telomere. The looping with the tert locus is disengaged in normal cells with short telomeres. Loss of telomere looping correlates with undermethylation of the tert locus, and that TRF2 may be mediating the mechanism of telomere looping. And we're trying to finish this all up and hopefully be submitting this off for publication shortly. And I'll just end by thanking uh, Juan Neil Kim, who's the champion of the uh, telomere looping project, and Elgin Member, who is the champion of the 6 thiodeoxyguanosine project. And uh, some of our newest work is now being done with collaborators here and in Tunisia. 
and uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to present this to you, and if there's a time, I'll be glad to entertain questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for Prophet Jerry for his outstanding uh, presentation. We learned uh, a lot indeed. And uh, because we are far behind the time uh, schedule, and uh, the next speaker, Prof. Ali Mashri, because he would like to catch his flight back to home, we unfortunately canceled this, uh, uh, this speech. I will uh, allow two not more than two questions. No, no, no. Two. I'll get four. I'll get four. Okay, two questions for Prof. Jerry and we'll go to Prof. Fornas after that. Sorry for this inconvenience. Please, have a seat. Have a seat. Yeah. No question. How come? Outstanding talk. The question is how many of these sequences are like it? We think this telomere position effect over long distance is going to be a major regulatory mechanism. It may be important in a whole variety of age-related diseases. And as part of our collaborations with our colleagues here in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we are going to try to get the most important ones as quickly as possible. We basically have just been using uh, basically our second uh, good instincts to pick genes that we think might be important. But in fact, we are now taking a list and going through the literature and asking everything that we've, we, we've got a list of like, like close to 5,000 genes where the first five megabases of every telomere of the genome is in sequence. And we're asking if any of those genes have anything to do with age-related diseases, whether it's neurodegenerative disease, it can be tissue-specific diseases, so there's a whole variety of possibilities out there, and we're going to be what I would be calling cherry-picking the most important diseases where this could be actually important. I think that right now it's still in the discovery phase, and then the question is, of course, what can you do about it? So if you can turn on a gene with just shortening of telomeres, what effect does that have on any process? And what we need to do is figure out, can we reverse that? Because it's easy today. One can go in and actually turn on telomeres. There are telomeres activators and things like that. So one can ask the question, can that reverse these types of diseases? It turns out there's a variety of diseases which we call telomeropathies. Telomeropathies are really genetic diseases. These are people that in fact have mutations in some component of whatever maintains telomeres. In a paper we've got in review right now with a group from Riyadh, we've actually discovered a family here in Saudi Arabia that has a specific genetic mutation that is, in fact, a telomeropathy. It involves a gene that's a law associated RNA binding protein. The, the details aren't important. What's important is there's probably a lot of human diseases that may be directly associated with the length of our telomeres. We used to think about telomeres as these little ends on our chromosomes, they're there, they don't do anything, they're repetitive DNA, we shouldn't even be thinking about these things, they're not genes. But in fact, these can be important regulatory mechanisms, especially in organisms like humans that live a long time. Recently, people have looked at long, uh, in larger organisms, like the elephant, and they've shown that the reason why elephants is called the Pico's paradox. The reason why elephants don't get cancer as much as they should, they're a hundred times bigger than a human, uh, yet they don't get cancer any more frequently than do. And what about the large, giant whales, the, the bowhead whale? And what they found in the, in the elephant is that elephants don't get cancer because they have extra copies of the P53 region. And in the bowhead whale, they found they had increased copies of DNA repair genes. So what is our benefit? Why don't we get cancer uh, more frequently than we really do? So we think this could really lead us to some new biology about mechanisms of the line, uh, regulation of cancer. Well, Thanks. So, uh, yeah, so um, what's, I mean, what's your experience with any fibroblasts? Muscle cells, fibroblasts. What's the, um, the different 
tissues. I'm wondering in brain, um, do you see through there shortening to no? No, so, so there are tissues where there's less uh, shortening. So neurons, of course, as you know, are mostly because of mitotic. The glial cells, the vascular epithelial cells turn over in the brain. And so you, you can't apply. This is the danger we get into in science. We want one universal answer to cancer, one universal answer to aging. I think aging is complex, and if telomere biology accounts for 10% of what normal human aging is about, I think that's just fine, and I think if we can, you know, so I, I think there's a danger in saying this is applied to all tissues. It certainly does. So there are there are there are pediatric benign uh, diseases uh, are, are, are we own a lot, but they're not as aggressive like you said. And a lot of those also spontaneously regress, just like the neuroblastoma. So there are there is about five to ten percent of cancer types we don't understand why people get these remissions. And it's possible at least some of those can be explained because they can't engage the telomerase enzyme to maintain their telomeres and therefore they senesce. Okay, thanks. One last question. Last is, is there is any link between the telomeres of the current abortion with now is there any sort of sort of side effect that cause a recurrent abortion of recurrent abortions? Yeah. We don't know. I mean fifty I think it's close to fifty percent women that get pregnant have spontaneous abortions in, in, in before they know they're pregnant. And we don't understand why there's such a high failure rate of fertilized eggs. So I think it's actually something that might be worth looking at. It could easily be involved uh, uh, in that sort of situation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Jerry, for your outstanding uh, presentation. Now? Um, uh, Professor Albert Fornes Jr. is director of the Water Center of um, Innovation for Metabolomics, uh, Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center in Georgetown University. He's going to talk about integration of, meta of metagenomics and metabolomics in gut mi microbiome research. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, great being back here again and uh, seeing old friends. And I'm sort of going to talk about something different uh, uh, today than I've uh, done in the past during my visits. And we'll be talking about some of our work uh, where we're trying to uh, emerge or at least integrate uh, some of the metagenetics uh, with metabolomics in, gut, in, in the gut biome. And uh, this is a joint effort. Uh, Miriam Gudarzi and my group has really uh, spearheaded much of this work, and also Heng Hong Lee has played an important role. And um, it's also done in collaboration with uh, John uh, Braun's group at uh, UCLA, uh, who are uh, uh, famous for some of their uh, microbiome work going back a ways. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is uh, just briefly uh, give a, a, an overview of the microbiome and health and disease. Um, uh, uh, talk about how we can now assess these bacterial communities, many of which we, you can't grow in culture, uh, using uh, high throughput uh, sequencing. And then uh, uh, try to tie this in with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it's a big problem and in, in, in increasing in, in frequency. Uh, and then uh, I'll make some introductory comments, very brief, on uh, metabolomics and uh, what we've uh, built at Georgetown and uh, developing uh, uh, microbiome metabolism uh, uh, approaches. And then uh, uh, we'll go down the impact of IBD, namely inflammatory bowel disease on metabolism. And then I'll finish up with a, a, a more acute uh, uh, model uh, for injury to the uh, gut and the microbiome using ionizing radiation. There is some overlap with other types of injury agents, but I'll just show this as an example. So in the case of the gut uh, flora, uh, it's uh, uh, highly complex. And let's see if I can find the mouse. Uh, probably not. Um, It's uh, highly complex, and uh, as I've uh, indicated here, there's 10 times more bacterial cells than there are uh, uh, um, uh, uh, both germ and, and somatic cells in, in, uh, in humans. 
Uh, also, the uh, a microbiotic or plastic, and it's, uh, there's a variation between uh, individuals, and it can change with time. Um, uh, as far as uh, advances in understanding um, uh, the, the microbiome, uh, next-gen sequencing and the like has shown that there's uh, probably about 10,000 different microbial uh, species there. Uh, there's 150 times more genes if you add up all these different genes from bacteria than there is in the human genome. And um, uh, one approach that we've been using is using a 16S um, uh, ribosomal DNA sequencing for rapid assessment. And a term you'll see in the literature and also I'll be using is OTU, uh, which is uh, for um, operational to taxonomic unit. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of effort in this area. If we look at human gut biome uh, publications in PubMed, uh, you can see that they really shot up over the last uh, uh, recent years. And uh, as far as trying to tie uh, uh, the gut and, and uh, uh, microbiome interactions, I'm showing an example here of a symbiosis of potentially beneficial or commensal uh, bacteria. And uh, what I'm showing here are receptors or surface proteins that are uh, glycoproteins, so they have sugars on the ends. The red triangles, which I can't point to, uh, uh, would represent fucose. And so there's a very common uh, null mutation in, in uh, humans uh, where uh, the uh, um, um, enzyme that uh, hooks up the, the fucose to these proteins is, is lost. And uh, so what we would have here is, uh, if we uh, think of the red uh, triangles as the fucose, there's a variety of bacteria binding here, and some of them um, uh, will have uh, commensal or potential uh, beneficial effects. There's also some advantages, particularly, oh, great. Uh, there's also some advantage uh, in not having the fucose, for example, with certain uh, uh, path pathogens, but uh, we won't be talking about that today. And um, uh, an important point is, is that these foot two uh, uh, null, which we refer to as non-secretors, uh, are at a higher risk of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So as far as OTU, just very briefly, uh, it's based on 16S RNA sequencing. It's present in all the bacteria in the archaea. And um, so uh, what we uh, basically do is that we're using the um, uh, conserved regions to uh, prime, and then we're sequencing a short stretch of about 150 or so nucleotides. And then we define these taxa of related bacteria uh, by um, uh, more than 97% uh, identity. And so you get these uh, groupings of bacteria that are, are somewhat uh, related. And so you can start looking at the different families or uh, genuses of uh, bacteria that, uh, and how they uh, change in, in disease or injury. Okay, as getting one to inflammatory bowel disease, uh, this uh, symbol up here on the uh, 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 top row uh, right shows that there's multiple uh, uh, components that are contributing to inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the incidence is increasing uh, uh, almost worldwide, uh, both in the USA and Europe, Mideast, China.